whether the president believes it in masks. You know, the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse the president believes it in masks. You know, the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson has said the good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe in it or not. He said the good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe in it or not. He said the good thing about science is that it's true whether you believe in it or not. The thing about science is that it's true whether you believe in it or not. But the thing is, when he says something, the public believes him. And when the public believes him, they stop wearing masks and they stop social distancing. And that is killing people. Governor Kasich, the Republican governor of North Dakota, Doug Burgum, uh, was emotional on this uh, topic. Here's what he told his constituents. If someone is wearing a mask, uh, they're not doing it to represent what political party they're in or what candidates they support. They might be doing it because they've got a five-year-old child who's who's been going through cancer treatments. They, they might have vulnerable adults in their life uh, who, are, who are currently up COVID and they're fighting. I mean, Governor, that was, you know, Good man. making the point here, this Good is not, not political. <laughs> You know, Aaron, let's just think for just back not that long ago to what we used to call natural disaster America, where we saw people showing up where there was terrible flooding, and they get in these boats and they go and rescue people. Nobody was saying, are you from a red state or a blue state? And frankly, I think most people are uh, aware of this. I think most people are acting responsibly. But it is, it's pretty interesting to see the, the numbers that are not. And again, back to natural disaster America brought out the best in us. And just yesterday I was watching uh, you know, the Battle of the Bulge, these incredible people that uh, put their lives on the line. Wearing a mask is really about respecting others and not transmitting. I mean, this is not complicated, and there's no reason for this, but it is beginning to tell us, when you see this, Aaron, the deep divisions that we have in our country, it's symptomatic of these divisions, and they must be healed if we're going to be a strong, you know, the strongest country we can possibly be. Dr. Rooney, you made the point, you know. T and I've noticed this, too, as well. He made a good point. I'm going to weigh in on it. It didn't matter if it was Hurricane Katrina or the tornadoes damage that I worked out in Charlotte, North Carolina, or the tornado damage that I may have worked in Phoenix, Arizona, or the catastrophes that I may have worked up in Kentucky pertaining to hurricane-type like winds up in Louisville, Kentucky, working for a body shop up there. In every, every catastrophe, it will weigh out the best in people on one perspective, but on the other perspective, it will weigh out the worst. Every time. There was people down in the Katrina damage that absolutely beg people to come down there and tell them more about God and the Bible and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there was others that you walked down there that if you even so much as looked like a Christian, if you had a Bible in your hand or was wearing a cross around your neck, you was substance of being violated or abused or somebody throwing some sort of accusation at you because of your appearance of believing in God. In every catastrophe, it basically separates the boys from the men, or the girls from the ladies. And people will either show their best side, or they'll show their worst side. Just a while ago, I had an incident happen where the people around here are still showing their ugly side, especially those who are about 10, 12, 15 years older than me. Rather than them admit to their defeat towards not supporting the windmill ministries, they're still lashing out. I spoke a while ago 
to an individual that used to run a parts store up here in Sharon, Tennessee. This individual was good enough to bring me through one of my last baptisms right up here in the Beach Grove Church that has now been abandoned and the trees and the weeds is taking it over. And that's the type of people that they uh, that a lot of them are around here. They'd rather see something go to ruin than they would to see something be used on a good concept. But he was one of the ones that drove me all the way to Hopkinsville or to Katie's, a little town called Katie's, Kentucky, whenever I was going through what I was going through up there pertaining to land between the lakes, in which if you know anything about my story, you know what I'm talking about, pertaining to a group of people that was trying to ruin me. And I thought at that time, this individual, Jimmy Jordan, was on my side. A matter of fact, because of the skepticism that I had with my brother David, even me giving David a thousand dollars, my brother, and telling him from time to time I'm probably going to need this, depending upon how much time I do in jail, pertaining to my conversary, of rather not, you know, it means a lot to be able to buy an extra Twinkie or a, a cold drink or to have money on your books to where you can actually make a telephone call to somebody if you want to. But I was very skeptical with my brother even though I gave him $1,000 and told him not to drive my truck. In which I found out after me being incarcerated for nine and a half months that my brother was in fact out here driving my truck. But David took that money and used it for other other principles or other means. He was sick at the time. He didn't have a job. He was basically living as proper. Uh, he didn't know heads from tails and what he was doing hardly. Um, he was sick. But also gave a thousand dollars to this individual, Mr. Gardner. I felt that Mr. Gardner thought enough of me and knowing my family and how long that I'd known this individual that he would that his word would be good to the point that he would send me money from time to time and sure enough my plan B had to be used because David fell through, my brother. After I got out of jail uh, Mr. Gardner gave me the remaining amount of money, I think it was around four hundred dollars and I thanked him and offered to give him some money for helping me do that and offered to give him some money for the truck ride of driving me all the way to Kentucky and he declined. He said that he didn't want nothing. Once more, me under the understanding in 2013, which was basically seven years ago, that he was still my friend, that he was still in favor. Well, since then, somebody obviously has gotten to him. I don't know if they got to him in a threat. I don't know if they got to him in pressuring him with fear. But since then, he has turned on me to the point that today, for the first time, I called him. Because yesterday, whenever I drove by his house, he was screaming and hollering and calling me the devil, Satan. And I thought, you know, that's really not like him. So I thought that I would call and once more he got ugly and called me an idiot and called me stupid and called me all these other flamboyant names and hung up the phone or I thought that it was a disconnected line because where I'm at out here my phone gets disconnected quite frequently so I called back he answered back but as he was talking are mumbling. He takes his other phone and dials 911. And as I'm sitting there listening to this individual that I thought was a friend of the family, talking to a 911 dispatcher about an individual, which was me, 
that had just got through calling him. Well, first of all, I was under the assumption that you never call 911 unless it's an absolutely 100% emergency. I think he was in violation and acting very unprofessional there. A man that's probably 15, 12, 15 years older than me. I'm 59. And secondly, if he's walking around here with a with a Christian platel on his shirt sleeve or on his collar, how come he's cussing, ratting, and raving, and I'm seeing the fruits coming from an individual that I would classify more as being a heathen than I would be towards being a Christian, towards cussing me and calling me every name in the book knowing that it was only because of him and his wife and his family who helped me through that situation. All I wanted was an explanation today. I didn't want the Calvary to be called. But like I said, whenever you're dealing with Whenever you're dealing with situations that are abnormal or unusual, such as a corona crisis, or a tornado, or a flood, or a hurricane, as many times as I've worked directly with law enforcement and the first responders, FEMA, and even the Corps of Engineers, as many times as I've worked with these type of situations, just as recently as the past three months. I was up in the Nashville, Tennessee area and the Cookville, Tennessee area because a tornado had hit in that area and I would have went to the crisis that was that had developed down in Jonesboro, Arkansas but because of the coronavirus I backed off of that going to that particular crisis towards going down there with a chainsaw and helping do cleanup, cleanup debris. I backed off of that one. But in every case that I've worked, you'll either see the best of the best come out of people or you'll see the ugliest of the ugliest. And I wouldn't even be bringing this up right now if it, if it A, it didn't happen to me today, and B, if it hadn't been so devastating and heartbreaking towards an individual that has known my family basically ever since we moved down here in 1967 to act in such of a way. And it's not just one particular person that has done this to me towards ostracizing me this way. It's been basically by and large the whole community because they are so dead set that they're so right and I'm so wrong that they're willing to show their ugly side in such of a horrendous, crazy, obnoxious, absolutely foolish way. And I think it has reached that same degree with Donald Trump is that he knows that he's been busted. He knows that he's been wrong about the coronavirus. But rather than admit it, for a good man can make a mistake, but it takes a better one to admit it, Rather than admit that he's made a mistake about the coronavirus and the toximity and the lethalness of this particular virus, he'd rather carry on and basically show himself to be an absolute fool. Just like, just like, just like the sign here is talking about mocking him for wearing a mask. He is an absolute fool to talk that way. And once more, the president, I mean, it's one thing for me to be sitting here talking to you right now, which hopefully it'll be seen or heard by at least one individual. Maybe on down the road it'll be seen and heard by a hundred individuals or a thousand individuals or a hundred thousand individuals. I don't know. But the thing about it is Donald Trump does have a strong, I'm going to use the word fan base, of people that is attached to what he has to say. I think it's something like 80 million people that whenever he speaks, it's almost like he's in your living room talking. 
and because he's that influential, the things that he says or the things that he does not say is very, very powerful. It's very, very meaningful in a lot of people's lives. And if you got somebody that's telling you, oh, this thing, it's nothing, it'll be gone tomorrow, pull the mask off, et cetera, et cetera, he's, the, some of these doctors and some of these um, politicians are right. He's basically telling people, to walk off into the mouth of the volcano. Donald Trump, whenever he put the ban out on the flights going coming from China, it was only a partial ban. It wasn't a full ban. Donald Trump has recently done the same thing to a place down in South America called Brazil. Usually whenever you do that, put a band on, there's usually a flood of people that will come out of the woodwork towards wanting to hurry up and rush back to America because they don't want to be caught down there towards not being able to fly back to America. They've done the same thing whenever they canceled the flight, uh, whenever they banded the flights from Europe and banded the flights in other places. We've seen a big flock of people come out of nowhere, people that had money to spend uh, on a twelve, fifteen, twenty-five hundred dollar plane ticket, like it was twenty-five dollars. Um, that's, as far as I'm concerned, in ways it's as it's, a, it's exact, exacerbating the problem. It's making the problem worse. We are soon going to hit a hundred thousand people that has died. Those hundred thousand people that has died because of the coronavirus was attached to probably 500,000 people in some form or fashion by their cousins, their uncles, their siblings, their mothers, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers, their friends. This is affecting a lot of people's lives. And that's the point that these, 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 uh, these uh, media commentaries are trying to bring out as well as these scientists and doctors and politicians that Donald Trump is an absolute fool by downplaying this virus the way that he has been downplaying it ever since it broke out. And if I'm not mistaken, there is the president of Brazil that the feds is looking for right now because of the same cotton picking thing of him downplaying the virus and now their death rate is 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 expanding or exceeding about a thousand people a day in that little country. Of course keep in mind Brazil is a very loving cuddling type country to begin with that don't mind disputing or dispersing of body fluids back and forth to each other and because of it I'm pretty sure that the death rate will only grow and intensify for the next few days in the next few weeks down there. But once more the authorities have taken it upon to themselves of chastising or rep reprimanding the president of Brazil because the president of Brazil has basically downplayed this disease that has costed the lives of their citizens down there. And Donald Trump is, is doing the exact same thing. That's the point that these people are trying to make. And the point that I'm trying to make is that people during the center of a crisis, and I don't know if it's just because they don't know how to react, I don't know if they're reacting the wrong way, I don't know if, if you take them out of their little comfort zone, that, that you see the trueness of that individual that comes out. I don't know why people respond and react the way that they do whenever, whenever something happens, regardless whether it's a flood or a fire or a hurricane or a tornado or, or, whatever, or whatever, but they do. It changes people. A crisis literally changes how a person feels, how a person thinks, how a person reacts. And I guess that's just the, the human characteristics of the bodily uh, adaptation, the way that most people adapt because basically whenever you realize that your whole life is just flashed in front of you to the point that you no longer have a home, you no longer have a house, 
you no longer have a couch, you no longer have an automobile, you no longer have a loved one, and because people are anchored, obviously, in tangible things versus supernatural things pertaining to God Almighty, because they're anchored in the wrong substance, it causes them to basically go bonkers. I personally believe that people like Mr. Gardner that I spoke to today that obviously called 911, he's obviously got something going on in his life. I don't know if it's with his wife. I don't know if it's with himself. I don't know if it's because of the coronavirus. I don't know if it's because of all the gossip, uh, the gossip that he's picked up on, on chatting pertaining to so Homeland social media. Of people telling lies and telling this and telling that. I don't know, but obviously people like this needs prayer. They need prayer, just like the people over in Kenton, Tennessee. Whenever I drive around the community over there and people see me and they recognize my automobile, regardless whether I'm in my truck or my car, a lot of them will freak out because they have been chatting about me so much that they have learned to accept a lie, they rather accept a lie than they would the, the truth, and it's and it's that way right here in this very neighborhood that I'm living in right here. They have created their own monster in their own mind, and now whenever they see me, that's the first thing they think of: the boogeyman, the boogeyman, the boogeyman isn't Juby. I promise you, the boogeyman is in their mind. And the boogeyman has been created falsely in their perception of how they interpret Juby. That's who the boogeyman is. And until I can break through that wave that, that of these seeds of disposition that has been sowed for the past 30 years, until I can break through those seeds and break through that wave of resistance, I don't know that the Windmill Ministries here at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 38255, will ever have a strong positive effect upon the people's lives the way that it is supposed to because of the hampering or dampering that Satan has planted in people's minds and in people's hearts, beginning with the elders or the pillars of the community that did not listen, that resisted this message going back 30 plus years ago. I know this, that by the hand and the will of God is the only reason why that I can sit and talk to you right now about these occurrences. And I know this, that I got people just right down the road from where I live, in one direction or the other, that will basically throw a party once they hear of the death of Dennis James Juby Jackson. They will be so glad that I am dead that they will be ecstatic to the point that they will throw a party. That's what I do know. I can only tell you what I do know. And I've got enemies about me that have entrenched an entrenchment around this ministry that was supposed to have taken off and been a positive force, the same as Billy Graham's ministry, Oral Roberts's ministry, Joe Osteen's ministry, or other major network industries that we're familiar with. That's the way that the Windmill Ministries was supposed to have been influential in the eyes of society. But because of all the negativity that they have spread abroad, they're not studying peace and utopia. They talk about peace and utopia, but in actuality, white man speaketh with forked tongue. If they wanted peace and utopia, they would go back to the cross and they would repent, just as the Bible teaches us in the first four chapters of Revelations. For he has not yet found our works perfect yet to go back to go back, to go back and get your heart and your life right with God. 
start acting civilized and start treating your brothers and sisters the way that you're supposed to start treating them. Not calling them every name under the sun and not showing your ugly side to this degree. I told my niece about it out in California and her first response was, Dennis, don't be surprised if somebody don't come and give you a visit. Which if that be the case, then that be the case. I'll have to deal with it on that level. And I'm pretty sure the first thing they're going to reach into the toolbox towards trying to grab hold of, oh, he's a stalker. He's a, he's a, a pedophile or, or he's a this or he's a that. I have never seen society so cruel and so ugly and so twisted and mixed up and upside down as I have today in my life at the age of 59. Calling good, bad, calling bad, good. Twisted, upside down. Just like the situation that they're talking about right now, pertaining to the coronavirus and Donald Trump. And trust me, I do understand somebody as influential as Mr. Trump. Or it doesn't just have to be somebody like Mr. Trump. It could be somebody like Elvis Presley or Michael Jackson, which both are dead. But I'm just using those two people as an illustration, that if you got that type of influence or, or Oprah or, or somebody like that, if you got that type of influence, you need to keep in mind that whenever you speak, people listen. Kind of like E.F. Hutton. When you speak, people listen. People want to hear what you got to say. And you become influential. Let's listen to the rest of this real quick. Talk about Neil deGrasse Tyson on the facts. The president's actions and his words are having an impact on what people do. All right, here's one man in Alabama. He, he said this to our Gary Tuckman. I mean, if he's not wearing a mask, I'm not going to wear a mask. If he's not worried, I'm not worried. The president. Yes, sir. I mean, that's exactly what, what, what is happening in some places. Doctor. I mean, the, 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 that's just the reality. Some people, they see it. That that's is happening. President, I'm not going. You are Gary Tuckman. I mean, if he's not wearing a mask, I'm not going to wear a mask. If he's not worried, I'm not worried. The president. I mean, if he's not wearing a mask, I'm not going to wear a mask. If he's not worried, I'm not worried. The president. I mean, if he's not. He said this to our Gary Tuckman. I mean, if he's not wearing a mask, I'm not going to wear a mask. If he's not worried, I'm not worried. The president. Yes, sir. I mean, that's exactly what, what, what is happening in some places, Doctor. I mean, the, 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 that's just the reality. Some people, they see it, and they do it. Yeah, his words matter. They matter a lot. And they, they, they cause people to doubt science. Look, in, in our hospital, we tested uh, antibodies in people who work in the COVID environment. And, you know, in healthcare providers, nurses and docs, they're actually lower than in the general population. And that's been emulated in places like Columbia and in New York because we wear masks. Masks prevent the transmission of virus from one person uh, to another. Uh, but they get in the way of the president's narrative that we're moving back to normal. If you're wearing a mask, how could things be normal? It's a really cynical calculus. The president is, is uh, forcing the country to choose between science and politics, and it's it's a really disastrous uh, situation. All right, Thank Aaron. You. When I was first yeah, elected yeah. governor, when I was first elected governor, it was a little bit bumpy, and uh, you know I'd make a comment here or there, smart aleck or whatever, getting used to the job. My wife looked at me one night and she said, "John, you're the father of Ohio. Why don't you act like it?" I repeated that to the president of the United States. You're the father of the country, act like it. If you act like it, we'd be more united and we wouldn't have these divisions. I, I hate to have to say it, but you gotta sometimes tell it like it is. Thanks, Aaron. All right, well, I thank you. And thanks uh, to you as well, Dr. Reiner, as always. And next, My for the pleasure. first time, Twitter is fact-checking Trump's tweets. And tonight, President Trump has just responded. 
and Brazil breaking another sobering record. Brazil has now surpassed the United States with the most reported coronavirus deaths over 48 per hour period. At one cemetery, 103 people were buried in one day. We're going to take you there live. for the first time. Twitter tonight added, you know, this is this has never happened before, fact-checking links to President Trump's uh, tweets about mail-in voting. As you can see, Twitter now prompting users to get the facts about mail-in ballots uh, because what the president had tweeted wasn't true. Clicking on that link takes users to a page which includes a section what you need to know. And the move follows Trump's false claims today that mail-in ballots cast in California will be, quote, substantially fraudulent and result in a, quote, rigged election. Tonight, Trump responding on Twitter, of course, writing, Twitter is completely stifling free speech and I as president won't allow it to happen. Brian Stelter joins me now. So Brian, I want to talk about that in one second. But first, the significance of this move. Twitter's been under a lot of pressure to do it. It's not easy to do. It's a slippery right. slope. What, what, what prompted it now? It's a step toward Twitter being more of a newsroom, acting more like an editor. And then once they have taken this action once, they will be under pressure to do it again and again because the president posts hundreds of things that are untrue or misleading or dangerous on the platform. Twitter up until now has not taken action, so it's a big deal that they are taking action. However, this is like spitting at Godzilla or spitting into the ocean. Pick whatever metaphor you want. This is a very minor action toward a very major problem, and that is a war on truth that continues every day unabated, not just by President Trump, but by many others using social media platforms. So it is notable Twitter's taking action, but a lot of people are going to look at this and say, too little, too late, or too little at all. And now the president is fighting back and saying he's not going to allow it to happen. So what, I mean, what can and he do? He welcomes this fight. He welcomes this fight. His campaign welcomes this fight. They want the 2020 campaign to be in part about what they say is conservative censorship, meaning censorship of conservatives by big tech and big media. That is a narrative they embrace because it means we are not talking about the number of dead and the number of sick people from COVID-19. They are going to embrace these kinds of fights. But look at what happened today with the, the Trump and Joe Scarborough. Trump is doubling down on this lie about Joe Scarborough, suggesting Scarborough is guilty of murder in the face of all evidence. And in the face of a widower who says, please stop talking about my dead wife the way you're talking about her. It is a shameful thing, but Twitter will not fact check it. Neither will Facebook, by the way. Facebook is just as culpable in these situations. What used to manage these things, Aaron, is shame and decency. You know, you'd be held in check by your peers, by news media outlets, by your fellow politicians, but it seems when someone is shameless and has no decency, there are none of those normal checks. Ultimately, what's going to cure this war on truth are good people of all political stripes saying, stop lying, stop making things up about voter fraud, stop hurting innocent dead people. But right now, Aaron, there's not enough pressure to stop it. All right, Brian, thank you very much. And next, the Trump administration just hours from stopping anyone who has been in Brazil from entering the United States. That's there hitting a new milestone. We're live on the ground in Brazil. the most reported daily coronavirus deaths for two days in a row. Cases have been exploding in the South American country as the Brazilian president downplays the virus. The Trump administration is now hours away from stopping anyone who has been in Brazil in the last two weeks from entering the United States. Nick Peyton Walsh is out front. This is a landing of last resort, seeking salvation in a coronavirus hotbed. Tiny planes bring the sickest COVID patients from hundreds of miles away deep in the Amazon to Manaus. Brazil's worst hit city and to a hospital bed. A journey most make alone, from which some won't go home. This is what doing well looks like on these flights, moving. The woman on board, struggling, motionless. Once, they had to intubate a patient in midair. It's very hard. You carry uh, a weight that you don't see. Every time I carry this weight, I feel like I carry this weight. They arrive in a city mired not only in death, but also fury. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has made light of the virus and called the mayor here a piece of excrement for digging these mass graves. 
they had little choice here when the bodies started piling up. This month, they buried 103 in one day, digging at night. Even in two hours, five come. One by one, laid in the trench. Many mourners say theirs aren't coronavirus deaths, but it's hard to know here. The official numbers in Brazil don't tell the whole picture, partly because there isn't enough testing. You can see that here. These are those who've died and have tested positive for coronavirus. But these graves, staggeringly, well, they're the ones that they suspect may have died of the disease. The mass burial itself distressing. We are here around 30 minutes waiting for more bodies. I just, I just want to put my mom there and, and finish this. We don't, we don't need this. My family doesn't need this. We asked the grave diggers who thinks fewer would have died here if the president had kept quiet. No one listens to Bolsonaro, one says. He's not there for the people, adds another. He should have asked us what was going on. But still the hospitals here receive a daily stream of new patients. These from outlying villages where local tribes live badly hit too. The ICU, which avoids ventilators where possible using less invasive means, is frenetic. And even the patients have heard what the president said. The mayor is just trying to save lives, says Raimondo, and the president is against that. Inside, a local indigenous leader visits, newly adopting the role from his father, killed by the virus two weeks ago. I took my father into hospital, where he was intubated for five days, he says. Now we have 300 people with symptoms. Politically, the president forgot us and is killing the indigenous people. Bolsonaro insists he is for economic growth and safety, but the virus is still tearing through the poor here. Their remote way of life was no protection from this modern plague. It just put help further away. Well, Aaron, that is where the worst place was, and this, troublingly, is where the worst place may be in the weeks ahead. Very familiar, I'm sure, to many watching. This is Copacabana Beach in Rio de Janeiro, a place that is likely to be a future hotspot. 4,000 dead in this area, 40,000 cases. As you said, the numbers now, day by day, increasingly worse in terms of dead than the United States. Brazil is on the way up in terms of its trajectory for infections and deaths. The peak one to two weeks away. And Rio, a healthcare system struggling, it seems, and a city where, while well, we're wearing masks here, the first time in Sao Paulo is pretty much everywhere. Here in Rio, you see a lot of people not wearing masks and a lot more of a sense of activity out on the streets than elsewhere. It could be very difficult for Brazil in the weeks ahead. Some models suggesting potentially 125,000 dead in total. Brazil really anxious about what comes next. Aaron? All right, thank you very much, Nick Payton Walsh. And Anderson starts now. Good evening, we have breaking news tonight. Twitter has begun putting fact-checking labels on some of the president's tweets. And Joe Biden has weighed in on the president taking jabs at him for wearing a mask. We'll have more on that shortly. We begin with the hardest fact that we know. Sometime tonight, or perhaps tomorrow at the current rate, deaths from coronavirus in this country will reach and surpass 100,000. One family's tragedy, one spouse's loss, one friend's absence, not 10 times, or even a thousand times 10, it is one life lost and everything that means times 100,000. Yet even as we grapple with that and we show you the faces of those who died, we want to focus especially tonight on the notion of this moment as a turning point when things could go either way. Looking at the moving average of new cases nationwide over the last two weeks, you can see it's barely changed, holding steady at about 20,000. Yet while as that line stays flat, thankfully, states and localities across the country have been lifting outbreak-related restrictions. And this holiday weekend, we saw not every place, but in many places, the almost total collapse of social distancing. Which is troubling to the experts, including at the World Health Organization, who see this moment as a potential turn for the worse toward a second peak in a first wave that is still hitting. Not a second, a second wave, it's a second peak. Others, others, the president included, are touting this as a turning point toward a re reopened country. And for a moment, let's just assume that he's right and ask, what does presidential leadership look like at such a time so that when everyone hopes 
what everyone hopes is a return to some kind of normality doesn't unleash a new wave of disease. What kind of things should a president be doing and saying? What kind of behavior should he be modeling? How should he be helping the country get through the loss of 100,000 American lives in just a matter of months? Well, tonight, he once again mocked the man running against him, former Vice President Biden, for wearing a mask in public. Biden can wear a mask, but he was standing uh, outside with his wife, perfect conditions, perfect weather. They're inside, they don't wear masks, and so I thought it was very unusual that he had one on, but I thought that was fine. I wasn't criticizing him at all. Why would I ever do a thing like that? Dana, uh, Dana Bash spoke with Vice President Biden and joins us shortly with his response to that. But the president asks a very good question, considering the governors, Republicans, as well as Democrats have been asking, telling, and sometimes emotionally begging people to do just that, to wear masks. If someone is wearing a mask, uh, they're not doing it to represent what political party they're in or what candidates they support. They might be doing it because they've got a five-year-old child who's who's been going through cancer treatments. They, they might have vulnerable adults in their life uh, who, are, who are currently have COVID and they're fighting. This is a, uh, I would say, senseless uh, dividing line. Uh, and, it, and I would ask people to uh, try to dial up your empathy and your understanding. Think about those two words, empathy and understanding. Those are qualities that have never carried partisan labels before, and they shouldn't. In any case, asking people to cover their faces in public isn't or shouldn't even be up for discussion. Just ask some of the, top, the president's own top advisors. Listen. As the country begins to reopen, don't forget to wear a cloth face covering when in public. We have the scientific evidence of how important mask wearing is. Go out, wear a mask, stay six feet away from anyone. A mask does prevent droplets from reaching others. As long as you're not in a crowd and you're not in a situation where you can physically transmit the virus. And that's what a mask is for. Remember, I wear my face covering to protect you and you wear yours to protect me. And out of respect for each other, as Americans that care for each other, we need to be wearing masks in public when we cannot social distance. We're all in this together. Just think about what Dr. Burke said there, out of respect for each other, out of care for each other. And yet the president of the United States, the leader of this country, whose own coronavirus task force is recommending and pleading and urging that people wear masks when they can't social distance outside, the president himself is undercutting that message. Not just by not wearing a mask himself, but by mocking Vice President Biden for wearing a mask. That's what he's doing. He's mocking the idea of wearing a mask. And he has the gall to do that when all the people around him, they're forced to wear masks. He doesn't, so he can appear on camera without a mask, but he can only do that because all the people around him, all the people who work in the White House who don't have the access to a constant doctor like he does, they wear masks to protect the president. The president does not do that for anybody else. As we've been seeing over the holiday, people are following the president's example, and that is the saddest thing of all. The president says he doesn't understand why Vice President Biden would be outside wearing a mask because what the president does and what the person who wants to be president does actually matters to people. It actually has an impact. People actually follow what the president does. It's amazing that people follow still what this president does after all he has said and all the lies he's told and all the irresponsible things he's done, but so be it. But he should know that and he should respect the fact that he is president and that people look up to him and follow him and he is doing something that is endangering other people's lives. That is just the basic truth. And that's what leadership looks like today, if you can call it that. Leadership today also apparently consists of spreading vile conspiracy theories on Twitter about the death of a former staffer for then Congressman Joe Scarborough and doing it over and over again. Traumatizing her family and her husband so deeply that he wrote to Twitter begging the company to take down the president's tweets because they're not true about his wife. The woman who died, who you're suggesting that Joe Scarborough was responsible? Yeah, a lot of people suggest that. And uh, hopefully someday people are going to find out. It's certainly a very suspicious situation, very sad. Very sad and very suspicious. Uh, question, please. I asked you not to tweet, tweet ahead, about it anymore, go. sir. 
Mr. President, though, have you seen the letter that was written uh, by her husband begging Twitter to, to delete your tweets, talking about how hard it's been for his family, for him yeah, to I deal have, with that? Yeah, but I'm sure that ultimately they want to get to the bottom of it, and it's a very serious situation. And as you know, there's no statute of limitations, so it would be a very good, uh, very good thing to do. What a little man. He's just a little man. He's the leader of the free world. He is a little, little man. A self-proclaimed wartime leader. A leader in the midst, he says, of a transition to greatness for the country. Spreading falsehoods about a dead woman, despite the pain and the pleas of her husband and the family, he doesn't even have the guts to say he doesn't care about what they think. No, no, he doesn't have the guts to say, you know what, I don't care what they think because this serves my political purposes. That's why he's doing it. He doesn't have the guts to say that because he is just a little man. I went through the exact same thing right here with my brother. I was accused of having sex with my brother. I was accused of having sex with a dog. I was accused of killing my own brother. People that did not have no decency about them at all was attacking me during the time of my grief and despair of losing a sibling. I have never seen society so cold, callous, and cruel as I have today. And they wonder how come I responded the way that I responded whenever I was falsely accused of trying to take care of some children across the road. And they put me in jail for wanting to help children. The world has gone mad. The world is sick. The world needs Jesus. The world needs deliverance. And until we see a mighty movement pertaining to a revival, I am just afraid that these occurrences are going to escalate and get worse and worse and worse. And I'm just not talking about the coronavirus. I'm talking about everything from A to Z from divorces, from famines, to floods, to fires, to you name it. In other words, the heat hadn't got hot enough yet for people to understand that these are signs that are given to society so society will learn from the signs and change their direction because of the signs. despite his girth and size. He's a little man inside and he knows that. That too is now what leadership looks like. The President of the United States raising conspiracy theories that the, about a dead woman, though her family's begging Twitter to take them down. As vile as the falsehoods are and as distracting as they are from the true facts at hand, the President always seems to have time for more, which is precisely what every expert on public health and public policy agrees is the opposite of what's called for, telling the truth. These are called unmoral people that are doing this to other people. Just like the Ridgeways and the Sheffields. These are unmoral people that will stand and accuse somebody of an accusation such as they have done to me or the President doing what he's doing to this particular woman's husband. They're unmoral people. They don't live a life of values, moral values, like the rest of us. And because of it, they're cold, they're insensitive, they're callous, they're cruel. They say, is vital to defeating a pandemic. Telling the truth saves lives right now. Today, the president also found time to spread falsehoods about mail-in voting, of course. There's no need to read the tweet out loud. The allegations are not true. Up on the screen, you can see the blue label at the bottom. It's small. That's what Twitter does. That's their big fact check. It put there by Twitter. It says, get the facts. And then you can press on the link to find the facts. You won't find the facts in the president's statements. I mean, Twitter is now acknowledging you won't find facts in the president's statements. That's where we are. In the midst of a pandemic, this is what we're talking about. This is what the president is talking about every single day. Man, it's 
starts, you know, you, I, you think it's normal. Like, you start to think this is just normal. It's not. Man, we are in trouble. More on this from CNN Chief White House Correspondent Jim Acosta, who joins us now. Jim, how are the president and his team, I mean, I know how they're responding. I'm going to leave this where it is right now. My viewers can take it for what it's worth in what I said and what other commentaries have said. But the bottom line is we are in a sad situation right now up onto the planet. And until we see a mighty movement, I'm just afraid that the sadness is even going to become sadder. And, and they don't have no one to blame but themselves. You know, whenever God found the sin in Adam and Eve, it was Adam that blamed Eve, and then Eve that blamed the serpent. We're going to have to quit passing the buck as, as a society and say, you know what? This is my fault. This is our fault. We're to blame here because of this. And until we as a society decide that we're going to act like a decent society, the decency in society is going to continue to escalate and grow worse and worse and worse. Regardless whether it's coming from the Ridgeways, the Sheffields, it's coming from the Gardeners, it's coming from other people that live right down the road that has showed their ugly side. It's going to continue to get worse until we as a society say enough is enough and we're no longer going to walk down this path. Good luck to all of us. As we say here at the Windmill Ministries again and again and again, good luck to each and every one of us. And shalom.